Hey t heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In this video, I'm gonna be geek diving into trying to work out what causes sweetness in tea and particularly what causes hui gan in tea. For those of you who don't know what hui gan is, I've done a video called What is Hui Gan? I'll put a link in the description below and you might wanna check that out. But shortcut, hui gan is this persistent sense of sweetness that comes after you have swallowed the tea. So it's an aftertaste. It comes from a transformation from bitterness. So it's not direct, simple sweetness, also called tian in Chinese. It is the returning sweetness. Hui means returning. Returning sweetness that comes from a transformation, usually from bitterness, and it is in the aftertaste, and it is persistent, cooling sweetness that lasts long after the session. So I've got lots of experiments lined up here. I'm gonna say from the outset that we're gonna be diving a little bit into the chemistry of tea, and I'm no chemist, I'm not a scientist, so I'm gonna give you my understanding of things, and if I'm wrong or if you have any uh, bone of contention to pick, then make sure you let me know in the comments section below, no offense taken. We've got lots of experiments, I have to say, I've injured my shoulder so you'll see that I'm a little bit restricted in my movement and you'll see maybe me wincing a little bit in pain and actually the injury was caused in the research to this video. Right, lots of experiments to get on with. Let's begin. What causes sweetness in tea? From my research, there are a few different things that cause sweetness in tea. The first is simple sugars, okay? So tea, in the processing of tea, uh, the cellulose in the tea will break down and that causes some sugar formation. So there are starches and sugars in tea that have a naturally sweet, simple, direct, tien sweetness. In other words, direct taste of sweetness. Then you've also got secondary sweetness that comes from the Maillard reaction, where a tea is heated up or roasted and those sugars in the tea naturally start to caramelize, they build up depth, they build up complexity, and they just have a bit more of that nutty warmth to it, so that more caramelled note to tea that has been roasted. So that's a result of the Maillard reaction. The third sense of sweetness comes from terpenes, specifically monoterpenes. So monoterpenes are those volatile aromatics like linalol, like geraniol, all of these very, very potent aromatics. Now, some people would say, well, they're not really taste their aromas, but I really think that they contribute to this sense of sweetness in tea. And finally, and what we wanna focus our attention on in this video, are glycosides. So if you take these terpenes, called monoterpenes, so single terpenes, and you group them together, so you bond them together, you can create diterpenes and you can create triterpenes. So triterpenes are three terpene molecules, specifically with 30 carbon atoms. Now, again, if I'm wrong on this and you wanna correct me, you chemists out there, then feel free to stick it in the description below. This is my understanding. So triterpenes are monoterpenes that have been bonded together to create this compound triterpenes. And it's very important <clears throat> to note that triterpenes tend to have a pharmacological effect on the body. In fact, steroids are triterpenes. And as soon as a triterpene becomes functional, it's a functional triterpene, then it's termed a triterpenoid, okay? So, triterpenoids, potent pharmacological uh, compounds. As I said, steroids are a form of triterpenoids. Now, a glycoside is when you take a compound and you bond it with a sugar, okay? And a triterpenoid glycoside, therefore, is taking a triterpenoid and bonding it with a sugar. In the plant, there are triterpenoid glycosides, now you understand what that means, that are called saponins. All that you need to know is saponins are a form of glycoside, <clears throat> which means a bonding of triterpenoids and sugar. And those triterpenoids have a pharmacological effect. And it's also important to note that these triterpenoids are used by the plant for self-defense and repair. So it has an active 
effect on the health of the plant. So these triterpenoid glycosides, let's just call them saponins from now on. So these saponins sit waiting in the vacuole deep inside the cells of the plant. And on the cell wall, in the cell wall are enzymes called glycosidase. Now these glycosidase enzymes are staying separate from the saponins. If they meet each other, then the enzyme gets to work and carves off the sugar and releases these triterpenoids, right? So in the case of an intact leaf, the enzyme and the saponins are kept separate. But when a leaf is attacked, let's say it's eaten by an insect, then the two mix. The enzyme mixes with the saponins and that carving off of the sugar happens and the triterpenoid is released to help to protect the plant. It might be to try to create aromatics to repel the insects. It may have other effects. I don't know enough about it and I can dive deeper if you're interested. But important to note that these triterpenoids have a pharmacological effect and they are obviously throughout nature, not just in tea. Now, if you watched my previous video, you'll see that I tasted big leaf cooding. Cooding have very potent medicinal glycosides, right? They are generally called cudinicide, but also other herbs like ginseng have glycosides called ginsenoside. Or for example, in licorice, you have glycyrizin, which is a, another glycoside. They are all triterpenoid glycosides and they all have pharmacological medicinal effects. And I suspect that triterpenoid uh, glycosides, also known as saponins, contribute to the medicinal effects of tea and perhaps contribute to this effect of bitterness because we know that the taste of bitterness generally relates to pharmacologically active compounds. An aspect of saponins that is characteristic of saponins is that they act similar to a soap. In other words, they can bond with oil and they can bond with water. And so they can uh, help to cleanse, which is why some people wash their hands with tea. And you can tell that a tea has saponins in it by doing the froth test, very similar to a detergent. And yes, this is how I injured my shoulder. So I'm gonna be very, very careful here. Oof, not happy that shoulder. I have here green tea, this is Naked Spring, and I have here some raw pu'er tea. This happens to be Monocle Boss, but it could be any raw pu'er tea. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shake these up vigorously and try not to injure my left shoulder. And what we're gonna see is if we can get persistent froth, because that persistent froth is a sign of saponins. So there's one, and I'm moving on to the second one. I'm gonna to try to, whoops, that's spilling everywhere. I'm gonna try, this was always gonna be messy. I'm gonna to try to do it for about the same amount of time and not injure my shoulder, right. So let's just let that settle and we can see already that there is froth on these two teas. So you can do this with any tea and you will see that there is a froth that develops. And that is your visual depictor that there are, uh, that the liquor is rich in saponins, these triterpenoid glycosides. And I think you can see that you can start to judge a little bit how much saponins are in there, I would guess. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. By doing a froth test like this, a little bit more scientifically accurate with the same amount of vigorous shaking for exactly the same amount of time, you should see the amount of froth and the persistence of froth represents the level of saponins in the tea. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that more froth means that you're gonna get more Hui Gan sweetness. We'll explain how this all relates to Hui Gan next. But you can see here, very persistent froth. And you can do this with most teas, but you'll notice that some teas have less than others. I would suggest you do it with some oolong teas. You can do this test yourself, and then you can obviously drink this lovely frothy tea. Yep, I would say that the 
Raw Pua has slightly more froth, but again, not very scientific. You can do this yourself. But the point here is to show you visually that saponins are in the tea. Right, let's bring this back out and try to figure out how all of this discussion of glycosides relates to sweetness and hui gan. And I should say that everything from now on is pretty much my own theory. There is not much written about this. There are you know papers here and there that sort of, I'm trying to join the dots a little bit here. So I may be completely wrong on this, but I think that there's an interesting relationship between glycosides and hui gan, glycosides and sweetness. If you look at other um, plants, medicinal plants that are rich in saponins. For example, as I said, ginseng, huang qi, astragalus, ku ding, licorice. They all have a character which is bitter to sweet. This sort of transformation from bitter to sweet. And I'm wondering whether or not that bitter to sweet uh, sensation or taste comes from the breaking down of the glycoside to release this sort of medicinal medicinal uh, triterpenoid and a sugar that pharmacological slightly bitter maybe you know more potent pharmacological compound and then the sugar aftertaste so oftentimes and I'm going to brew this up again with my left hand so I'm going to just warm up this teapot here. Oftentimes, or most of the time, gun is used to describe puerty, raw puerty. And I have in front of me some canopy flasher, one of my favorite raw puerties for hui gun, because I think it's really, really rich in this returning sweetness. And I, I'm sort of questioning why, why is that? Why is it that raw pua teas tend to have more hui gan than other types of tea? And I'm trying to sort of join the dots here is to figure out what is it about, for example, black tea or uh, oolong tea that means that it tends to have more direct straight ahead sweetness and less of this bitter to sweet transformation, this hui gan persistent sweetness. And I'm thinking, that it might be to do with the glycosides and specifically how the glycosides are broken down. Because in the case of teas that are more processed, so I'm talking about, for example, um, oolong teas, and I'm talking about white teas, and I'm talking about black teas. So teas that go through an extended wither period, what's happening there? What's happening is during the withering period, the cell walls are breaking down. The enzyme, the glycosidase enzyme in the cell wall is mixing with the saponins in the vacuoles of the cell walls, and they're carving off the sugars, and they're creating those secondary aromatics, which is why we love oolong teas for those beautiful flowery, fruity aromas that get created by the breaking down of glycosides to release these triterpenoids that then probably get broken down <clears throat> into monoterpenes, that beautiful aromatic, those beautiful aromatic terpenes. So during the withering phase of oolong tea, during the long extended withering drying phase of white tea, or during the very deliberate breaking down of leaves in the rolling phase of black tea, we are forcing enzyme and saponin together, right? And that means that the sugars are being created to make sweeter teas, and those triterpenoids are given enough time for them to create aromatics. And in the case of roasted oolongs, or if a black tea is heated up, you're also starting to get secondary Maillard reactions. So the sugars that are being created from the breaking down of glycosides into sugar and terpenes, and also the sugars that are naturally in the tea will start to become more caramelized and nutty through the Maillard reaction. And that's why white teas, oolong teas, and black teas tend to have more straight ahead sweetness and less of this bitter to sweet transformation. Whereas green teas and these raw pu'ers here, they have less processing. It's more about capturing the state of the tea leaf, less of this interaction between enzyme and saponin. And so with green teas, 
I'm imagining that the glycosides are very much fully intact, okay? With pueties, I would say that they're they are fully intact, but because of the fact that there is a little bit more of a withering phase here, and because of the fact that glycosidase, the enzyme in the leaf that breaks down the saponins, is more heat resistant, shall we say, than other enzymes, the enzyme doesn't get denatured as much. So it's still sort of slowly active in the leaf, um, and therefore it's going to start to release some of the sugars, but not all of them. And so you're going to get glycosides ready there. Now, I think that the two tea types that have the most hui gun are green tea and raw pua. I think raw pua the most by quite a long way. And this might not just be about processing. Remember that there are different cultivars involved in uh, raw pua and therefore you're gonna get different types of saponins. Yes, I'm making a bit of a mess here. Not easy brewing with a slightly injured shoulder or a very injured shoulder. Okay, let's brew this up. I'm gonna put half the amount of water in here. I wanna just brew a nice strong brew to really bring out those, that hui gun uh, taste. So you've got green tea, and you've got raw pueti, relatively unprocessed, um, therefore protecting more of the glycosides, therefore more glycosides are gonna be released in the liquor, and therefore if, big if, if hui gan is related to glycosides, then you would imagine that the more intact glycosides in green tea and in raw pueti would therefore bring about more hui gan, and as I said, different cultivars, different land, different terroir, huge different varieties between raw pua, which is from the Asamica big leaf variety, and green tea, which is from the small leaf sinensis variety. And so you're gonna get different makeups of compounds. It's gonna be lots of differences. But I'm imagining that it's, uh, that there are different types of saponins that relate to different levels of hui gan, but also the processing makes a big difference there. And that is why oolongs, whites, and black teas tend to be straight ahead, more tian sweetness and less hui gan. Again, this is my theory, not necessarily true, but let's have this discussion and then you can correct me. God, I must look really, really strange pouring like this. Let me just, oh, I really damaged my shoulder doing vigorous shaking of jam jars um, <laughs> yesterday. You can see here, again, the froth is persistent. I would still say that the raw pua has a little bit more. Yesterday when I did the test, it was a little bit more pronounced. Maybe I didn't shake strong enough that raw pua. Let's now taste canopy flash. As I said, I love this tea for hui gun. This is the one I go to for hui gun. So let's taste it. I intentionally brewed it strong with boiling hot water to extract everything. And if it is those glycosides that contribute to that hui gan sensation or sweetness, then we want there to be that bitterness first, right? And I'm getting it. I'm getting a sort of seven or eight out of 10 bitterness, but very quickly I'm getting that transformation. Now in the previous video, what is hui gan? I said that there were a few different types of bitterness. Bitterness which persists the least um, enjoyable. Bitterness which transforms to astringency or puckering nature, physical nature. I like that. But the most desired, bitterness that transforms to sweetness, that's what hui gan is. And usually in teas, there's a combination of different types of bitterness altogether. I'm getting a tiny persistence, but most of it is transforming to a slightly dry, slightly astringent, but nice sweetness that I know will continue and continue and continue for hours after drinking this brew. So what is happening here? Why am I getting sweetness? If the, glyco if the glycosides or the saponins are bonded together where I'm getting the, these triterpenoids, which may be lovely aromatics, or they may be slightly bitter, we don't know. And I'm mixing it or bonding it with sugar, and that's persistent in the actual cup, then how am I getting a sweet taste? 
because if they're bonded together, I would imagine that I can't really taste the sweetness that much. Again, may be wrong here. Please do let me know if I'm wrong. And I'm thinking that there may be a couple of things here. The first thing is that maybe just simply through the brewing action, the compounds come together and the glycosidase enzyme in the leaf may be having an effect. I doubt it because I would imagine that with 100 degree water, you're starting to deactivate or denature the glycosidase. In fact, what I, what, when I was reading up about glycosidase, I found that the sort of optimum temperature for the enzyme to work is about 50 degrees Celsius. And then after that, it starts to become more and more denatured. Um, so I don't know if that's the case, but let's not forget your saliva. In your mouth, in your saliva, you have got glycosidase enzymes. So these glycosidase enzymes may be carving off the sugar from the glycosides in the tea. And that means that it takes some time, but you're getting this residual returning sweetness that develops. Again, my theory may be wrong, but do an experiment. Brew some raw pu'er very strong and do this experiment with me, okay? Strip your mouth of saliva. Try to swallow all your saliva, get it as dry as possible. And now drink the tea and try to register the amount of bitterness in the tea. Here we go. Up to about an eight or nine, but again, disappears beautifully, wow, lovely, transforms. And now I'm getting slowly, slowly, as more saliva is released, a sweet juiciness starts to develop. Now, repeat the experiment. What I'd like you to do is allow that juiciness to develop. I know it sounds a bit disgusting, but we're gonna do it. Let's build up saliva in our mouth. Let's try to just build up a juiciness in our mouth. Don't swallow, keep it in there, right? Once you've got like a juicy amount of saliva in your mouth, then we're gonna put the tea in our mouth and we're gonna combine it with the saliva. Try not to taste, just combine it with the saliva. Allow potentially, again, all my own theory, I might be completely wrong, but potentially the glycosidase enzyme in your saliva to start to carve off and break down the glycosides in the tea liquor and then swallow it as before and let's register the amount of bitterness. I've got enough saliva in my mouth. Here we go. Much less bitter much less bitter, much more sweet. Now, I would have done it for longer, but I'm obviously conscious of you staring at somebody swilling tea around in their mouth for too long. Do it for a little bit longer than that. And I think you'll notice that you're gonna get much less bitterness. Now, this could be completely wrong. It might be that you're just diluting the tea with saliva and therefore you're not picking up so much bitterness. But I do get a sense that it might be correct that the enzymes in your saliva will be breaking down the glycosides in the tea and that will be causing you to have a sweeter tea. Um, and now, this is what's interesting here. This is why people love raw pu'er so much. And green teas are to, to a lesser extent, but it certainly is the, the, the same, the, the truth holds, is that with oolong teas, with black teas, even with white teas, the taste, the initial taste, is much more sort of the main event of the tea. Now, of course, you get amazing aftertaste with oolong teas and white teas. I'm not, not saying otherwise, but with specifically with green teas and with pu'er teas, it's much more about the aftertaste than the taste. And why, if this theory holds, if this theory holds, and it's a bit of a wild one, I, I, I grant you that. But if this theory holds, then basically you are creating this breakdown that happens during the withering phase of a tea. You are creating this aromatic release in your mouth and down your throat whilst you are drinking. So you are transforming the tea in your mouth. And if you follow that uh, glycosidase enzyme 
has its optimum uh, performance at 50 degrees Celsius, then drinking your tea at a, at a warm but not hot level will generally create a more aromatic and sweet tea. And we've noticed this time and time again, which is why we like to use small cups in Gongfu Brewing, is that when you brew in small cups, it cools down the liquor and the taste just is more on point, a little bit more sweet, especially for these types of teas. So you don't want to be drinking scalding hot raw pu'er if this theory holds up. Oh. Beautiful, because what happens is that this returning sweetness is not just a sweetness, it's this release, this vaporous release of aromatics. And if this theory is correct, then essentially what may be happening is that the glycosides are being carved off, being broken, and releasing these terpenes, these uh, aromatics. So I'm getting the fruity notes that this lovely, uh, cute little cheeky bat is representing. I'm getting those Asian pears, durians, and bananas. Those terpenes, those fruity terpenes are coming out, and that comes out as an aftertaste rather than a taste. Another sip of this. Mm. Oh, lovely. Mm. Potent. I love it. I love that potent hit that you get of that bitterness moving to sweetness. And now, you know, I'm thinking that it's that triterpenoid glycosides, those saponins that are really, you know, causing this sensation and this taste. Okay, so let's just try to recap. So sweetness in tea can come from sugars in tea. It can come from the Maillard reaction. It can at least be contributed to by those rich aromatic terpenes, monoterpenes in tea, and also it can come from glycosides. The specific type of glycoside in tea that is potentially medicinal and also sweet are called saponins. And those saponins potentially, when they get broken down, will release the triterpenoids that create aromatics and a pharmacological effect, but also can create sweetness. And in my theory, the idea is that teas which have more intact glycosides, so less processing and more intact glycosides, like green teas and like raw puas, will have a tendency more to have that bitter to sweet transformation. And I'm thinking that raw puas are even richer than green teas, specifically because of the terroir, the cultivar, and the age of the tea plant. Because one of the things that we always look for in uh, raw pua is that rich huigan tends to come from older tea trees. And that's a whole other exploration as to why the glycosides may be different or in different quantities. So in general, if you're looking to experience huigan in tea, you want to be looking for tea which is minimally processed. So not as much withering time, and therefore you should be focusing your attention away from white teas, yellow teas, oolong teas, and black teas that just go through more processing and some roasting, and focus your attention on green teas and on raw pu'er teas. I think ripe pu'er teas go through a lot more processing as well, and therefore I would say, again, that is the reason why ripe pu'er teas tend to have less hui gan. And then when you compare green teas and raw pu'er teas, I think the reason why they are rich in hui gan is, again, my theory may be wrong, is because they're richer in glycosides. Perhaps the fact that raw pu'er um, is, has gone through a lower heating phase and is a little bit more uh, the uh, the glycoside the glycosidase enzyme may be a little bit more active because it's sun dried and therefore you know it's just more active. Maybe that that enzyme that's active in the leaf is slowly slowly breaking down the glycosides and releasing a bit more of the sugary note and therefore you're getting that sweetness uh, developing faster than with green teas. But I also think it's to do with the cultivar, large leaf versus small leaf, the terroir, the age of the tea trees, the picking, there's many other factors that will have an effect on the type and the quantity and the stage of breakdown that these glycosides are at. Again, 
just my theory. I hope that you enjoyed this deep dive into the sweetness of tea and hui gan. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. That's it, tea heads. Check out our other videos, taste our teas wherever you are in the world by browsing mayleaf.com and come visit us if you're ever in London. Other than that, I'm Don from Mayleaf. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags. Keep drinking the good stuff and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye.